Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me OK in the back? You're all good. OK, thank you. Uh, as Jess said, thank you all for taking some time out of your day today to be here. Um, my name is Alex. I photograph pets for my job, which is a pretty cool job to have. Uh, today my talk is fairly informal. I photograph animals. It's meant to be fun and light and happy. So lots of photographs to show you, a few stories to go with them, uh, some tips on my seven factors that I think I've had to really perfect in order to photograph animals and kind of really you know, hone in on my craft. And then a few little business tips as well, just in things that have made my business, um, I guess, ticked it along nicely and helped me along the way. I am taking questions at the end. So if anyone has a question at the end, please feel free to ask. I'm open to um, asking anything. I don't have any photography secrets, so feel free. Firstly, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Sometimes I have very nice straight hair, and at home in Australia, I quite often like to walk around with a possum on my shoulder. Uh, that actually may not be true, but uh, I did do a photo shoot with one recently. I have pets. I think as a pet photographer, it's very important to have pets, because then you have animals that you can ad nauseum photograph at home. And these are my two dogs, Pip in the back, and the dog with the best name for a photographer, for a photographer's dog, Pixel, in the front, a little rescue greyhound. I also have a fat cat called Macy. It's not all fluff, she's very overweight, quite sadly. And this is Pip, who is very excited to be sitting next to her cat sister. All my pets get along really well. Uh, they love each other greatly, and there's lots of respect between them. <laughs> Isn't that typical cat? Just, the dog's really sweet, she just punched her in the face. When I was 19, I joined the West Australian Police Service, and I served for 14 years. Uh, this is a photograph for a newspaper article for we have Red Nose Day over there to raise money for Southern Infant Death Syndrome. And we were made to do things like this, which may or may not play a part in why I eventually left. Uh, but I did do 14 years. My last two were spent at the child abuse unit, which as you can imagine was pretty harrowing and intense. And I guess I just got overwhelmed by knowing what people did to each other. So I, I wanted to change a direction. And one particular day I had a really strong moment. I saw a photograph of a dead child and for the first time in 14 years I thought I have to do something else. So I then went into another enforcement role, auditing airports and airport airlines around Western Australia for their counter-terrorist security measures. So I travelled around and we checked things like how they secure aircraft and airports. And five years into that, I basically started taking photographs. So that was 10 years ago. And now I'm very privileged to say that my life is literally defined by images. I think as photographers, you would notice little things now that you didn't notice maybe before. You see the leaf on the ground and the way it reflects in the light and the way puddles shine and little things that, even if you don't photograph, you notice around you in the environment all the time. So now when I go to Bali, Indonesia, say to photograph for a dog rescue group, and my friends say to me, oh, what was your villa like? And did you have a swimming pool? And what about the restaurants? I go, yeah, they're great. But here's some geese, a monkey, and two macaques playing bitey face. There's also generally a photograph of a chicken as well. That is literally my holiday to Bali. I don't photograph very often anything outside of my lane. I really stick to animals and that's it. People generally think that being a pet photographer, all I do all day is hug on animals. I think it's quite disrespectful because I work really hard and I try and create connections with them by really standing back and taking shots using lots of different lenses. Sometimes, occasionally, they might come up to me and I might just give them a hug, but I'm a professional. Hands off, job to do. Don't be hugging them. Get on with it. Oh, and that's me and Pixel. That's a lovely one to end on. I get asked a lot, why did you choose animals? And if I'm being really honest, they actually chose me. So 10 years ago, when I got my first DSLR, I thought, this photography thing, it has to be really easy. I see lots of great photos all the time. Let's just, you know, photograph everything. I want to do landscapes, tractors, people, dogs. And I realised within about three months that it wasn't easy. Does anyone find it not easy to do everything really broadly? And I was at the park one day with a friend and her daughter. And the daughter was doing some ballet twirling. And while she was twirling, I saw some ducks kind of wandering by. And I said, oh, just keep spinning, darling. So while she was spinning, I just photographed the ducks. And I came home with more photos of ducks than I did of the family. And it started happening more and more often. Every time a dog came past or a cat walked in, that was my focus. It became the natural focus of my lens. So I loved it. I was getting the best results. And I still find everything outside of that a little bit difficult. 
I can get by, but I really have to think and concentrate to do it. So I was just like, well, clearly this is what I'm the best at. This is what I love. I'm just going to stay there. Initially, I was quite heavily criticised for that. Ten years ago, digital photography was becoming more popular. And animal photographers back then didn't shoot 300 frames on film, like I now do in a shoot. So it wasn't that prevalent. It was something that portrait photographers did now and then, but not really as a specialty. So I remember going to a camera club one day and, and someone saying to me, you'll grow out of that. Everyone does that when they're learning. And I went to a small business centre and I sat down and I said, I had an hour consult for free advice. And I said, I want to open a pet photographic studio, like for people, but for pets. And he said, that will only ever be a hobby. And I'd just like to say, right now I'm standing in B&H B talking to all of you. So we should send him an email let him know. <laughs> I was very lucky that I found my niche. Some people do have a really broad skill set in a lot of areas, and I, I am not one of those people. And I guess if you're not sure of what your own niche is, there's a little bit of advice that I could probably give. It's basically what do you love the most. And I think sometimes we have to think a niche is portraits of people, landscapes, animals. It can be broken down. If you like photographing the rare African land snail, and that's what makes your heart sing, that's what you photograph. And trust me, you photograph it, and you photograph it well, and you keep photographing it, that becomes your thing. Who else in the world knows of anyone that photographs a rare African land snail? There isn't anyone. It's honing down on that thing that just really lifts you, that you love. It could be leaves on the ground. You just do it, and you do it well. And at the end of the day, you shoot for yourself. Because there's that thing, if you take photos to want to it, well, you take photographs to engage with people, but if that's your whole intention, is a photograph for someone else, you, you ask for 100 opinions, you're going to get 100 opinions. If you like it, that's good enough. You took it, you understood what was in the making of that image, and you're shooting for yourself. Every time I take a photograph, I think, even if it's just a dog sitting there, what am I trying to convey? Who am I shooting to show? Who, who am I conveying my message to? and I take photos for a purpose. And early on in my business, I had to get really clear about what I was actually trying to do with my photography. Because when you work in certain areas, particularly with animals, there's an expectation that you are all things to all animals. So people started to ask me, what do you eat? What do you wear? How do you feel about certain animal organizations, circuses, horse racing? While I have opinions on all those things, at the end of the day, I'm an animal photographer. I can't be everything to all animals all at once. So we had a chat about, what am I, what am I trying to do? When I say we, I'm referring to Deb sitting on the back. What, what are we trying to do? Why, why every day do I do this? And I came up with two main aims. One, showcase the beauty of all animals through photographs. Every time I take a picture of someone's pet or an animal in a, in a rescue shelter or wildlife, I'm trying to always come back to this. So that means I always shoot in a positive light. I never show pictures that are graphic or distressing. If the dog is very skinny and has ribs sticking out like that, I just do a pose where that's kind of hidden and you notice the beauty of the animal first and then maybe, oh, it's a little bit skinny as a second thought. So I never lead with the disability or the infliction or anything like that. And the second aim through then taking those photos is I use the funds that, that are raised and the time that that gives me to promote, support and endorse animal rescue all around the world, whether it's dog rescue, bear rescue, tiger rescue. They're my two aims. So when someone says, what do you eat? I say, through my photography, I have two aims. One is to support and promote and endorse animal rescue. One is two, to show people how beautiful animals are. Because from a business point of view, that is my main goal. And that's why every day I get up and do what I do. I got very lucky in 2008, one of my airport auditing trips, I had to go and audit the airport at Cocos Keeling Island. Uh, it's off the west coast of Australia, a beautiful little volcanic atoll, and in this very rustic clam breeding facility, I happened to get this shot. I came home, I had a $350 budget Canon camera at the time, came home and put it on a very small, not very you know, well trafficked website that I had, and people started saying, I love that blue slugs, someone called it. Uh, my dad called it blue crabs. He doesn't get out much. Uh, and people started saying, I love that blue photo. So I entered it in a few Australian photographic competitions and it won some. And one of the ones that won was quite a big one and it got me gallery representation. And it was the first time people came to me and said, can I please buy that? 
I, of course, said, sure. Uh, now, it really is the photograph that made me think, up to that point, I'd just been doing cheap $50 pet shoots for disco photos, a bit of wildlife, too much time invested, not a lot of money, not loving it. You understand what I'm saying. So I thought, wow, people want to pay money for this. This as a print, which is sold a little bit bigger than on the screen, are $1,000 each framed, and I have sold 69 of 100. This is my only potential $100,000 shot. But to even have one, yeah, wow, I'm really blessed. I used to resent it because I don't photograph underwater. They were underwater. I was above the water, leaning in. But in photography competitions, it goes in the underwater category. And I'd submit 15 photos of kangaroos that I thought were great, and then this, and this is the only picture that the competitions would call back. <laughs> and, I'm like, and I used to be like, ah, oh, and then I grew up a bit, and I thought, you know what? How blessed am I to have that shot? Anyone wants to buy one? No, give me a call. <laughs> uh, it was also featured on the cover of this magazine in Australia too, and it actually won Best Magazine Cover in Australia. It beat out Australian Geographic, similar to National Geographic, and a few others. So. No, sorry, they were, did I use an underwater enclosure was the question. They were in a big kind of rustic tank, kind of the ocean was reclaiming it a bit, and I just leant over, put my reflection on the water, and shot through, above the water, through it. So they're, they're probably this long, and they're probably that far underwater, and I was that far above them. They actually, as I bent down, um, they closed because I moved, and I had my camera on single shot. And I thought, oh, so I took three shots, I waited and waited like this, you know, getting old, I was bent over, and I took a few shots, and they opened, took three shots, they saw my finger move, and they closed again, I thought, oh, that's it, um, you know, oh, there's a seagull, oh, off we go, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I was very lucky I got that shot in there. So I think there are seven factors that you really need to, well, I've, I've had to, I guess, uh, grow and develop to take great animal photos. I'm not going to go into um, how you work with animals and photograph them, these are actually attributes that you have to develop in order to be able to photograph them. Or things that you need. Firstly, let's start with, without equipment, you can't do anything. So we'll start with that. You need gear. As mentioned earlier, I shoot Tamron. And I'm very proud to be the super performance series for Tamron in Australia. What does that mean? It just means that I use the lenses. My agreement with Tamron Australia, I don't have to tell anyone I use the lenses. I don't have to sell lenses. I don't get paid to sell lenses or talk about lenses. I just use them because every single picture in this presentation is shot on one of those lenses sitting on that table, and I'll run through with you which ones they are. So I really think the proof is in the pudding. I use a Canon 1DX Mark II body, for anyone that's keen, and I combine them with these awesome Tamron lenses. Sometimes I have to do modelling, it's a tough life. <laughs> really, hopefully everyone's looking at that and not down there. Uh, sometimes I stand with tigers, get my picture taken, and sometimes uh, Pip and Pixel come in. These were some modelling shots for some of the primes. Um, quite amazing the clarity you can get on these prime lenses just in the studio. That brings me to studio. So five days of the week when I'm not travelling, uh, you can find me at home in my studio. I basically photograph for rescue organisations and private clients mostly for their pets, predominantly dogs, but I also do a bit of everything. My go-to studio lens, so all these pictures you're about to see, 99% of them are taken on the Tamron 24 to 70 mil lens. Occasionally I'll use a macro if I'm photographing insects, and if I photograph venomous snakes, literally snakes, that if they bite you, you'll die within 15 minutes, I have a zoom and I'm standing four metres away on a chair, <laughs> normally holding my breath and having to have a lie down later. Uh, I found a snail in my mailbox, great, let's photograph the snail. I judge a lot of photography competitions, so I love when I enter competitions and I get feedback myself. The feedback on this one, I tried really hard to get the eyes nice and sharp, and I love that kind of blurred out background look. The feedback was, the shell is blurry. And I was like, oh, please, do you know how hard it is to get a catch light in a snail's eye? <laughs> this would be a 90 mil macro lens shot for a little praying mantis. I'll photograph anything I can find, a, a grasshopper, um, this guy, see the size of his mouth? It was actually about the size of the top of my thumb. And he kept jumping on my eye. And when things jump or move, I keep really still. I've learnt not to, oh, just keep still. And he jumped on my eye. And after about the 15th time of me having him removed, I thought I should say to the person that had a pet grasshopper, they can't bite, can they? And he said, oh, yeah, if their mouth's big enough. His mouth was like, I know, I could have died. I'd be like this, talking to you today, like, hey, what's wrong with her eye? 
a lady rang up and said, I've got goldfish. Do you photograph fish? I went, yeah, I photograph anything. And I hung up and went, oh no. <laughs> Seriously, how do you photograph in a studio someone's fish? So I rocked up to her house. I made her put buckets of water out overnight, get all the water settled. And we had to set up basically a white backdrop, a table like this, and the fish were here in a big wine glass. And I had my studio light at the front. And of course, lighting from the front on glass, just flashback glare on the glass constantly. And she's like, and I'm just looking at the camera and going, <laughs> internally, on the outside, I was like, oh, it's going really well. This is, I'm thinking, oh my God. She's saying, how's it going? I said, oh, they're coming out great. She said, can I look at some? Oh, no, not till later. they just we'll get a few more. So I thought, oh, my goodness. So what I did is I moved the light. Actually, this is a table behind, shooting behind. So I had the backdrop where the fish is, the table, shooting behind. So I don't have the catch light in the eye, but this is literally an out-of-camera shot apart from a tiny little bit of the wine glass that I shopped out. And then I went, oh, my God, look. And she just went, yeah. She had no doubt that as the animal photographer, that's what I would get. I, of course, was completely blown away. Uh, so I'm now on the search for more fish shoots, but no one wants to bring them in. Uh, I photograph reptiles, do a lot of Australian reptiles. And as I mentioned, um, venomous snakes and non-venomous snakes, lots of lizards. All these animals, too, I'm generally sitting about this far away from. So yeah, within, well within the nice strike rate of some. Uh, a little red-eared slider turtle. That is my little finger. Just show how small he was. That's my selfie, by the way. It's pretty good <laughs> Baby ducklings. Mm. Baby stuff is always a heart grabber. Uh, rainbow lorikeet. In Australia, these birds are actually considered pests. They're introduced, and if they get taken to the vet clinic, the vets legally have to euthanize them. So a lot of the, I know, and they're so beautiful. It's horrible, and they're really smart. You can have them as pets, but a lot of the vets actually can't euthanize them. They keep them, and they bring them to me for photo shoots. So I, quite ironically, this was one of the photographs in the bird series that won International Professional Pet Photographer of the Year, and it's of an animal that's technically a pest, which I think really says a lot about its classification in my home country. Uh, birds in flight. My studio is a third the size of this room. It's very small. I don't have a lot of space. Yeah, it's tiny. It's literally like this length and probably four metres wide. So I don't have a lot of space to, for birds to get up a good flight. They literally go from here to there. But if I'm really quick, I can sometimes catch. They're going from a perch, just jumping to their owner. I do cats. White cats, different coloured eyes are generally uh, deaf. And I threw in a few Australian baby natives for you as well. I think we have some of the most beautiful baby animals in Australia. So this is obviously a kangaroo joey. His name was Calvin Klein. He's quite <laughs> lovely. Max the baby wombat. Spent the next hour head butting me and trying to bite me. Like the size of a football, tiny. Uh, Luana the koala. So this is just shot in the, at the wildlife centre, the owners, their house in their attic. Just, Luana just came across from the park, wildlife park, which is right next to their home. Um, where we live on the west coast of Australia, we don't have any koalas. They're on the east coast. So we only see them in the wildlife parks. And I love them because I haven't seen a lot of them growing up. So when Luana climbed off the perch and came and sat with me and touched my elbow, I just burst into tears in front of the whole room of people doing the shoot. I only cry now because I love them. I mean, look at that. It's like a little bear thing. And oh, God, it's amazing. And baby, tiny baby Tasmanian devil. Um, these are, you know, Taz, the cartoon. Taz, Tasmanian devil, yeah, baby one of those. This is one of two twins. They actually have a dreadful facial cancer that can be spread from devil to devil by biting. It's one of only two transferable cancers in the world that can be spread like that. The other one's in monkeys. So it's wiping them out. So they've got uh, clean colonies off the island of Tasmania, where they're from, to try and um, save the population. So these babies, that are, their mum actually died of devil facial tumour disease. So they're being hand reared. They love their carer, but have one of the strongest jaws in the world, so you wouldn't put your finger in there. I uh, do a lot of cats. Cats are generally in the studio. One, difficult. Two, awake. Three, asleep. Um, now, we've talked about Zen dogs. To be a Zen dog, you have to be actually having a bit of an extended blink. You can't be asleep. So Zen cats, I've only got four photos in 10 years because they're either awake or asleep. This is one of them. So I'm thinking about just releasing it as a, as a flyer, maybe a leaflet. You will get one for free. <laughs> be double-sided. And of course, I do a lot of rescue animals as well. This dog had mange. And I've actually quoted myself there, but the point is I travel all around the world to rescue centers. And I sometimes am critical of countries like Bali and Indonesia, places in India where the animal abuses are quite prolific. There's nothing I haven't seen there that I haven't seen in my own home city. 
uh, through my work with uh, organisations. So even in Australia, a Western first world country, we still have a lot, a lot to do. I photograph big dogs and I photograph small dogs. Sometimes I like to write quotes on the photographs. This particular quote I wrote, now all I've done is the dog sitting on a little ottoman. I've moved the treat and it's looked at a treat and then looked back. By putting these words with it, putting it on Facebook, the amount of people that wrote to me, very upset that the dog was sad, <laughs> was innumerable. So you can really manipulate your audience. And you've got to be careful with that because people will take it really literally. And I'm like, the dog just got a treat. It's fine. Uh, puppies. Puppies are always fun. They go. You have to get eight catch lights in eight eyes. And then eventually they'll start to conk out. You've got one man standing. And if you wait about half an hour, whew, this box of photos for Stacey because she had a boxer. That's for you, Stace, that one. <laughs> for the babies. They eventually fall asleep. So it's good time to take shots. The other part of what I do, so everything in the studio and then outdoors I do wildlife and some domestic pets for animal shelters, not for private clients. So these are mostly all shot on the, well I'll tell you, 24 to 70 when I want a little bit of environment and landscape. Most of them are taken on the 70 to 200 mil terminal lens which is just sitting here and some are on the lens coined the beast, it is a beast of a lens, the 150 to 600 mil that's sitting there on the table. I choose these lenses based on what I'm shooting on the day. So before I go out, I think I am photographing in Vietnam at a bear rescue centre. Captive bears that have been rescued are going to be fairly close proximity to me, so I might take the moderate zoom. I am going to go out on the Jeep in Safari in Africa, the animals are miles away, I'll take the super zoom. I'm going to be photographing dogs that are sitting right in front of me, or you know, turtles or whatever it is at the zoo, I'll take the portrait lens. So when I, I do photo tours as well as part of my job, so every day we sit as a group and I say to people, right, today the animals will be this big and this close, or elephants and miles away, or elephants and right here. It all plays a part in what lenses I select. Oops, sorry. Baby orangutan sucking its thumb. This has taken, anyone been to the zoo in Singapore? It's a fantastic natural barrier zoo. And there's two free roaming colonies of orangutans that just wander around. And these guys were eating mangosteen. I was so far back and it was so dark, I didn't even realise till I got home that she was sucking her thumb. Um, may or may not be the cover of my second book too, which is number four, so we'll move on. Uh, tiger, this was actually taken through glass. It's a captive rescued tiger. Sometimes shooting through glass, I use generally autofocus. It won't quite focus because there's always that kind of barrier. Yeah, you guys are nodding. So there's always just that distortion. Uh, so I was lucky here, the closer they are, the easier it is to shoot through it. <coughs> Further back, just get that kind of wobbly vibe. Peyton the koala. Koalas, when they're babies, are on their mother's milk. Gives them lots of energy, lots of personality. As they get older, they go onto gum leaves, eucalyptus leaves, that don't have any nutrients in them. Basically bombs them out and they sleep for 23 and a half hours a day. Peyton is the exception. At about a year old at this wildlife park, they normally go on exhibit with the other koalas. People can walk past and see them. At two years old, she decided it would still be fun to jump on people when they didn't know as they're walking by. So <laughs> she only recently went out on exhibit with all the others. She, her thing used to be me to take her photo and her to grab my watch and try and bite it and steal it. She was a thief and, a, and an attacker when you weren't looking. There's some other little Australian natives, bandicoots. Um, we use this photo as a Mother's Day promotion and then realise that the big one is not a mother. <laughs> I'll just leave that right there. A uh, little rescued elephant from Cambodia. So again, this sort of shot, I've either got the 70, 200 mil zoom, or sometimes even the 24 to 70 if I'm really close. And I would have been fairly, fairly close to her. Uh, any shots too where I've cropped, I crop in camera using the lens. There's no existing shot of her entire head where I've just cropped her in half. I try and see it in my mind's eye as I'm shooting through. Uh, this is the 150 to 600 mil. I was doing a trial of it in a really dark rescue raptor centre, thinking, how's it going to go in these sheds where it's quite dim? And it just it blew my mind. I mean, I'm literally here to the wall away from that bird. So it was nice and relaxed because I was far enough away and I could get a nice sharp shot. Uh, a little very rare kind of white coloured meerkat. Tasmanian devil yawning, again, these are all taken with the big super zoom. 
and orangutan. This guy was taken at our local zoo, Perth Zoo. They do a lot of charity work with some of the charities I work for. So I sometimes photograph out there for them. And the orangutan viewing platform is on the roof. It's off exhibit up the top. And I was up there and we were giving them frozen bananas as treats to get them to kind of respond. And while we were photographing him behind us, I heard <laughs> And I turned around and one of the female orangutans was going <laughs> to us like, hey, where's my banana? And the keeper said to me, oh, I'm the third ranked keeper. So they know that. So they really, they treat me not very well because I'm not the first keeper. And she turned around to her and said, if you do that one more time, you're getting your frozen banana last. Mm -hmm. right? And I was like, oh, that told her. Anyway, next minute, I see the orangutan going like this. She goes like that. She had gone toilet in her hand and she was threatening to throw it at us. I <laughs> like, and the keeper went, put that down now. And she went like that and she dropped it 20 feet and we were like, so just give her the banana. She said, what's the banana? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> they're just, they're incredible. Uh, little monkey at the monkey temple in India, he's actually teething, so he's chewing on the concrete. Baby macaques, we work at a rescue centre in Cambodia and the wild macaques come in because they know they're not going to be hunted within the grounds, they're protected there. Um, got to be very careful working with macaques, especially when there's babies. In the monkey forest in Ubud, I, I researched it before I went, it is like monkey Armageddon. You go in there, there's three colonies of monkeys, they're grabbing tourists, they grab your sunglasses and go like that. When you try and grab them, they bare their teeth and lunge at you. And they're this big. Anyway, I read that what they do is they'll let the babies go. So you're standing out there just, you know, with your camera. Of course, you'd have a body on the other end of it, but like this. And suddenly there'd be a baby there. And they'd be like, oh, wow, that's so cute. There's a baby monkey. What they do then is realize that mum's not nearby and scream. And you have 60 monkeys flying in trying to kill you. So all the tourists were like, come here, monkey. And every time a monkey came to me, I was like, whoa, get away. Uh, and people were looking at me like I was mad. But even that, I had a, that actual lens I was just holding. She was probably as far away as the wall. And I just, the mum was not looking. I made sure every time I took a shot, because mum could have just flown at me if she'd realised I was too close to baby. Baby reaching out, kind of trying to grab me. I was like, no, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, I led a photo tour earlier this year to the Antarctic which is, um, was pretty magical. It was a long way away. It took us about 40 hours to get there. And again, I thought I'd actually use the 70, 200 mil portrait lens because everything is right there. Penguins are right there. Baby seals are right there. When I got there, I put on the super zoom, the big one, because it just gave me extra reach. I could shoot the penguins at the back and the penguins at the front. It was fantastic. Um, on a Zodiac, motoring around just seals laying on icebergs, and the penguin with the rock. Um, it's very interesting being a judge of lots of competitions. I do some camera club stuff and some high level comps in Australia as well. And a photograph very similar to this one, or placed in a very prestigious photographic competition we have called the Anzang, Australia, New Zealand, New Guinea photographic competition. And when I saw it a few years ago, I thought, wow, they went to Antarctic they found a penguin that had a rock. I mean, how often do you really see anything flying around with something in its beak? And they got an amazing shot. So I, my experience in assessing that photographs based on what I know of, wow, you had to go to the Antarctic, find the one penguin with the rock, and get the picture. When we walked onto the land at the Antarctic, every penguin had a rock in its beak. <laughs> and the lesson for me was that you do, you judge based on your own experience. Now when I see that photo, I'm like, I think I got it on my iPhone. But you get my point. It was just everywhere. They were pinching rocks from other birds' nests, carrying them around. It is a situational photograph. If any of us were in the Antarctic, we could all get that shot. We just have to get there. Um, and again, little guy just motoring by on an iceberg in the snow. It was absolutely magic. If you can ever go there, it really is a once-in-a-lifetime trip. And they're cold, gnarled feet on cold, gnarled, gnarled ground. We went in summer, so I actually did sometimes on the ice have a T-shirt on but I tend to be a little, always a little bit too hot. So it was about five degrees, similar to some of the weather we've had in New York earlier this week. Uh, sometimes just shoot a little bit of motion blur. This guy was just about to launch, so I used quite a slow shutter speed. Again, I had the big zoom on, so it's quite a way away. And not the best photo, but this was my dream photograph of 10 years. It's called a thorny devil. It's a lizard that you find out in the desert in Australia. They're quite small, probably a bit bigger than this, harmless, but they look like aliens from a different planet. And my dream photograph was in my home state. And every time I went to the areas these guys were, people would say, ah, oh, here's my photo of one. They whip out their phone. Or, ah, oh, you should have been here yesterday. There's, there's four of them over there mm -hmm. for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, in March this year, I was lucky enough to go up there. I actually went up to Ayers Rock 
to work and I found one and I may or may not have cried hysterically over that as well, little things, I mean, you know, generally I'm pretty tough. Um, I work with a charity whose job it is to go into indigenous communities and improve the animal health. It's very privileged, they go in a lot of places that generally um, white people can't go. We get special permits and permission from the locals in the community. And this is obviously the very famous Ayers Rock, also known as Uluru. And Ayers Rock has some sacred sites on it that you cannot photograph. I had to do a DVD training course, sign some contracts, and then be shown some pictures that's very specific. Everything has to be approved. So the dog is blocking one site, and the other one was up the other end. But um, beautiful dogs, just local camp community dogs. Sometimes the local people don't want to be the star of the photo, but I say, could you hold the puppy? Because I think it speaks volumes about the care for that little animal. And we sterilise the mum too, so that's the last litter she'll ever have. 60 sterilisations in a community prevents about 2,000 unwanted births in like 10 years. It's quite amazing. Um, Deb had asked me for years, oh, I want a photo of jellyfish. I'm like, well, the river's a bit dirty. I don't know if I'm going to go in there with my snorkel. So I went to an aquarium and stood there actually with this portrait lens up against the glass. Really high ISO because it was dark, very dark. And there was a spotlight that is changing colour. They're actually white. And I had to deal with like people coming up with their iPhones with the flash on. So it's just flashing off, I don't know, flashing off the glass. And I stood there probably for an hour. Luckily, there was a penguin feed. Everyone ran over there. I was like, thank goodness, and shot and shot. And I only got a few shots, but I got what I wanted. And a little beautiful natural light shot of Alex Pig. I have a pig named after me. I know, I'm very proud of that. Uh, this little girl is from a rescue center in Tasmania where the Tasmanian devils are. Friends of ours own a farm sanctuary there, a rescue center. And Deb and I went there to visit to take some photos. I don't know a lot about pigs. I know they can eat your bones if you fall over and die. So that's a little bit scary. Uh, and I didn't know too much about them. We went in and there were 60 adult pigs in this great big enclosure that have all been rescued. And this little black pig, this big, just ran at me. And this particular shot, I'm actually trying to get away. She's chasing me, I'm trying to run away. She really liked me. And I thought, that's fine. My friend Emma, who runs the sanctuary, was sitting with a pig and I saw her rub its stomach and the pig laid down. So she was rubbing it on the stomach. And I thought, oh, I've got my own little pig friend. So I tried that with Alex Pig, rubbed her tummy and she laid down. I was like, wow, pigs are great. They're kind of like dogs. I was patting her like this. And Emma was over there and she looked across at me and went, <gasps> and I went, what? And she goes, that pig's wild. And I went, ah! She goes, oh my God, since she's been here, she's bitten everyone, she's not friendly, she's, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know, she seems all right now. <laughs> anyway, it turned out that three weeks earlier, basically people were ringing her, saying, three of your pigs are out, they're on the highway. She's like, no, they're all here. And one day went up to her gate, and sure enough, these three little pigs, this sounds like the story, they huffed and they puffed and they, and, uh, they were standing at her gate. She thinks they'd escaped from an abattoir, probably about maybe three miles away, and come through the forest. Anyway, yeah, since they got there, no one could touch them. They were feral, angry, and just not friendly. For some reason, the day I got there, she decided that I was her person, and we had this great bond. So they called her Alex. Two years later, we went back, and I said, where's Alex Pig, my amazing kindred spirit pig? We had such a great connection. And they said, oh, she's in the barn. And I went in, and this is what I saw, <laughs> this great big pig. And again, she said, oh, just be careful of her. She's a bit, I said, okay. And I went up and I said, Alex Pig, it's me, Alex. And she was like, Pfft. And I was like, oh, wow, that's not what I expected. And I went up to her and she was, again, she was huffing, puffing, angry. And I thought, oh, my goodness, like, we had such a great connection. She doesn't know who I am. And she's just angry and she's, Pfft. And I went, oh. So I tried for about 20 minutes. I got one photo. She was really agitated. And I thought, this is not nice for her. I'm going to leave. I looked down and I saw a cow standing in the dam. And I thought, well, Alex Pig, you're great. First part of that story was lovely, but it's a bit disappointing. I'm going to go down and see the cow in the dam. So I got down there and I was sitting near some reeds near the dam and photographing the cow. When you have your camera up, you don't have any peripheral vision. So all of a sudden I heard <laughs> and I looked. I'm sitting, so I was quite small. There was Alex Pig. She had followed me about half an hour later from the barn down to the dam. And I was a bit frightened because she was angry. I uh, put out my hand and she sniffed it. No lie, waggled her ears, threw herself on the ground. And I know, my pig was back. I've only got one, but make it worth it. And I just, people ran over and took photos because, yeah, she's normally crazy. And then she ran around, had some photos at the dam too. Happy day. Occasionally too, I use the 90mm macro lens, really specific stuff. 
Uh, if I'm in a forest, I might just mind map out a two square meter area and very carefully go around in there and photograph those tiny little details, including you know, teeny, tiny, tiny spiders. And this is a little tiny skink about probably a bit longer than my finger. And just laid there and he kept popping his head out and I managed to catch him. Equipment, we've well covered it. You need gear, you need subjects. And where do you find them? There's some animals I think we really overlook that we can all use to take pictures of. Seagulls. They're accessible, they're agreeable, and for birds in flight, they're great to practice on. Birds in flight are really difficult. I still even struggle with that. So it's great to have easily accessible subjects just down at the beach, the lake. Ducks. Ducks, herons, water birds. Easily accessible to photograph. Crabs at the beach. Again, something so simple, but something we sometimes overlook. If we walk past, if you sit on the beach and wait, they kind of all come out. Farm animals. If you know anyone who's got horses, goats, sheep, again, easy to photograph, fairly safe and agreeable as well. And dogs. This is just, we went to a winery for some wine tasting. And this was just the winery dog. I was like, oh, I take a picture of her. I would have had this lens on, a little bit of environment in there. I was just, let's photograph your dog. These guys were just sitting at doggy daycare. They love, they're like, take our photo, lady. I'm like, okay, just wait a minute. They're so agreeable to it, they love it. And just bounce the ball, grab that shot. And here in New York City, something I'm a bit obsessed with, and it's kind of like spot the tourist in the park, but you've got squirrels. Again, but they're great, sub they're fast. They generally don't kind of do what you want. They're darting and they're erratic. So great to, to practice on when you are out on safari doing something that you need those skills for. I think you need patience. This is something I actually really had to learn when I first started shooting in the studio. I would be, I have an hour session, I'd have a dog that was literally jumping off the walls. And I'd be thinking, oh my God, I'm not getting any pictures. And on the outside, I'd be really calm. Oh, that's great. On the inside, I'd be like, ah! They feed on that, they know that. So they would play up more. I had to completely let go of any sort of control, worrying about time or am I getting enough images? Because the animals, they pick up on that sort of stuff straight away. You need time patience. That is sometimes to sit there and shoot and shoot till you get what you want. And image patience is a number of images you might have to shoot to get what you want. When I went to India, I was at the Taj Mahal, one of the most beautiful buildings in the whole world. It's, I'm not into buildings, but this blew my mind. And I saw these two dogs playing down beside it. I thought they were street dogs, but to be in there, they must have been owned by a groundskeeper or something, because they're quite well kept. And I said, I have to take a photo of those dogs. So this is the close shot, and then this is the wide shot. Um, I, had, I had this lens on. I'm trying to actually get the entire Taj Mahal in the shot with the dogs in the foreground. During the shoot, actually an American lady walked past. I'm going to do a really bad American accent. She came past and said, um, oh, she's at the Taj Mahal and she's photographing the dogs. <laughs> and I thought that was actually a fair point because no one goes to the Taj Mahal. All you notice is the Taj Mahal. Have you ever seen a photo of a Taj Mahal with dogs in it? It doesn't happen. It is so beautiful. And people on my tour said to her, she's an animal photographer. It's what she does. And she's like, oh, OK, that makes sense. Uh, but I worked and worked. I took 300 shots. We had 20 minutes until we got on the bus. And I kept chopping off the top of the Taj Mahal because the dogs were moving. I shot and shot and shot till I got that one shot that I wanted. I know, thanks. Um, <laughs> but it was worth it because that's the picture I've never seen before of the Taj Mahal. But 300 photos, I got one. The rest were rubbish. And it's just that timing, that patience. So you have those friends that have pictures like this on Facebook. And they say, oh my God, look. And you're like, the log floated down the stream. <laughs> and then you realize if you just wait, that, that time, patience, waiting. If the elephant is rolling in the pond, at some point it has come out. So up she came and did a big splash. Again, it's just timing. Now, again, I might have had to take a thousand shots to get this one, but I still waited and I was patient and I timed it. Another thing that greatly helps me is anticipation. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So I know if I make a noise or squeak a ball, there's going to be a response generally from my subject. Sometimes you only get the response once. You might squeak that ball and they look, next time they're like, got to do better than that. I sometimes do, I'll do it for you, it's very embarrassing. I go, meow, 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 meow. I don't know. Thanks, Deb. She thinks she loves it. I do it at home. Just walk around, meow, meow, meow. Make Deb laugh. Uh, but yeah, I do that. And dogs generally 
normally because they're thinking, you're not a cat and that is weird, but they'll look. So you get that split second reaction. The more you learn about behaviours, the better, one for safety as well. And the more you can then preempt movements and responses. So I know if I hold this up and do something, I'm going to get a response. In that is also the two most common questions I get asked. One, how do you get them to sit still and how do you get them to pose? Now the answer to both, because they are animals, is I just don't. I literally let them do whatever they like. I'm like the bad auntie. Have all the junk food. You kick me in the face. Don't jump on the couch. Just let me take your photo while you're doing it. So I'm very, uh, there's no rules. I'll occasionally ask them to sit, drop, and if they know those commands, they'll do it. But generally, they're doing whatever they like. They don't pose and they don't do what you want, which is kind of what I like about them. I think that's a challenge for me. So I gave, I try and do everything authentically. I try not to, like, I don't use peanut butter on dogs to get them to lick or anything like that. I try and just catch a lick. I gave the rabbits the piece of grass and I knew that they were doing this, like both eating. I knew, it's, it's just anticipation. What's gonna happen next? Eventually, when they got to the end. Now, there's no way we could have held those rabbits there like that. There's no way we would have. They would have been, the more you push, the more they push back. It's not nice for them. That was so organic that you get that shot. A uh, little Caspian tern, little rescue bird that was released not long after this. And I was like, oh, 100 photos of this. I was like, he's great, but it's a bit boring. And I said, they said, oh, well, it's nearly time for his lunch. He loves his lunch. I said, oh, let's get out his lunch. That's better. <laughs> Anticipating when they held up the food, he would yell. A little kangaroo joey in a blanket, tiny, tiny joey. You can tell she's so vulnerable and small. And I was like, oh, that's nice, but it doesn't, it's cute, but uh, you know, something more, we need something more. Uh, they said, oh, she loves, when she gets in a blanket, she gets really excited. And I was like, okay, let's, I'll try and time it and you know, the anticipation of her movement. And that's like the precious from the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> but it's much, the other one was cute, but that is just even more engaging, a little face. Little tiny possum. Straight away, any animal people will know, ears back, scared, vulnerable, not comfortable. She's on a, the little log is just on a little couch. She's only that half the ground. Straight away I went, that, she doesn't like this. I don't like this, it's not nice for her. They said, oh, she loves being in a carer's hand. It makes her feel safe. I said, let's pop her in there. Much again. And what happened, her ears, she had her ears down, not flat, but just beside her head. And I just went, and she went, Oop. anticipated that movement. Um, I find in the studio, dogs are the hardest and the easiest. And that is, they're either really agreeable, because it's the crazy auntie that gives them everything, or they're very aware that I'm a stranger. There's studio lighting, you know, there's noises, there's flashes, there's cameras. They're very aware of their environment. Everything else, apart from cats who are generally just difficult, everything else, they're generally not that aware that in the way dogs are. So guinea pigs, birds, uh, reptiles, Australian natives, just sit there. They might just go, oh, the light flashed. They're like, whatever, they're not fussed. So birds I find incredibly easy. If you sit them there for long enough, they're warm under the lights. They start to preen and get really comfortable and you know then you're going to get some great stuff. That's kind of cute. So pink and grey galah. I waited because I know they eventually will stretch. And when I got the stretch, I was like, that's fantastic. So just a split second. Anyone seen the BBC video, Nighttime, Daytime? Yeah, if you haven't, go home and Google. It's these little birds running going, Nighttime, Daytime, um, which is the name of that shot. It's very cute. Baby sugar glider. Um, some people in the States have these as pets. This is a wildlife park and they had all the sugar gliders in a big um, cage about to be sent to another park. A storm came, they all got displaced. When they matched them back up later, there was a baby left over. So it had to be hand raised. So if you Google sugar glider photos, you'll get a lot of pictures that look like this, just eating its food. And I thought that's kind of nice, but I want something different. I noticed he kept running up his carer's arm. And I kept saying to the carer, can you just put him back? And as he went like that, Max, his name was, just grabbed his finger, put his feet down, and ran straight back up. In that split second of anticipation that he was going to step down, I got one shot. I've never got it with him again since. But again, it's, it's deceptive. It looks like he's holding the guy's hand and standing there. It was literally a fraction of a second. And an echidna, um, unlike porcupines, they can't lose their quills, but they're still very spiky and they can burrow down. And I thought, oh, that's cute, you know, running along, but. <laughs> very cute but the carer from the wildlife park said did you know their tongues are like the length of your forearm like the little beak on the kidney is only that big I said that's not I think that's true she said let's put some food out and see what happens and 
I was like, how does that fit in there? I don't know. It doesn't work. And lastly, this is Precious, the tawny frog mouth. I photographed her, if you're a rescue bird, uh, photographed her for the last seven years. And normally this is how she looks. A bit startled, like not quite sure what's going on. And this particular day, she just decided, how about give you something different? I said, thanks very much. And I got one wing stretch out of her. Very lucky, because generally she doesn't know what the date is. All that kind of ties into to timing. You need to always be ready. You miss the, the shot you miss might be the shot you never get again. And in my style of shooting, I tend to shoot organically. And by that, I mean I pretty much let my subject do whatever they want. Even wildlife, I'm just watching and waiting for those moments and capturing them. If I do have to photograph people, I, I prefer to use the same method. If it's a, an event and people don't know they're being photographed, that kind of organic shooting, just pick them out and grab them, rather than trying to pose people. Um, I just like to have conversations with them, make them feel relaxed. The elephant picture, oh, we'll move on to a sec. Um, again, these shots, there was nothing on his face. The puppy just happened to lick. I noticed the puppy kept going to the other dog's face. I thought, oh, at some point, and at some point he licked. Push the button because the timing was bang on. <laughs> this dog is like this big, it's like really big, and a little tiny, tiny puppy. And because I was holding the treat up here, the little dog just stood up like that, like, what about me? And trying to, you know, be bigger. So again, we didn't set that up. It happened organically, and the timing was right to get that shot. The pigs. Now, it looks cute. It could have been this one saying, don't eat the treat, it's mine, and like a dominant thing, but it looked like they're doing a little kiss. That movement, just trying to get something, just even some sort of action and motion makes it a little bit different to just standard cat picture laying there. Tongues will smell, They're using their tongues. <laughs> it's a tongue. <laughs> it's not, it's a snake. Um, but uh, basically they smell using their tongue. So they'll put their tongue out to sniff you. And so it's timing. The tongue shot's far more interesting than the tongue being in, inside its mouth. And again, just birds stretching, timing it to capture that. And there's no angry way to say bubbles. Um, I sometimes listen to what clients are saying in the background. They won't, because I was popping them. I was like, oh, no one wants that photo. I was popping the bubbles. And I heard the client saying, oh, bubbles are really, her bubbles are so cute. And I thought, oh, stop popping them, get a photo. And of course, she actually bought that as a big photograph. And I think she actually even had the caption on there as well, because it's very true. And boxes are great for blowing bubbles. And again, timing. This is actually a sun bear. They're normally quite flat coated and it's in the pool and having a, a swim. And what I love about this, again, it's a shot different to any other sun bear shot I've ever seen, just by grabbing the timing of it coming up. It was rolling around, at some point it had to come out. And dogs, timing, making a noise and knowing when they look, there's gonna be all eyes looking towards the light, I can get all those catch lights in the eyes. And again, these are all shot in camera, so all those five dogs are actually sitting there together. Generally try to always be authentic in doing that. Sometimes hard, but we work hard to set it up and then go, go, go and get the shot. And you need safety. This is probably very important, especially around animals. You need to do your research of subjects before you encounter them. Set your own rules and boundaries and have self-awareness. I work in a lot of Southeast Asian countries and sometimes uh, there'll be a tiger enclosure and they'll say, oh, Miss Alex, you go up to that fence over those three fences and you photograph the tiger. And I say, how come everyone else is right over there behind the barricade and they're like, ah, oh, that for safety. <laughs> so I then have to decide, do I want to be in the unsafe area? How close do I want to be? What am I going to do in that situation? Um, the Great Rescue Centre in Cambodia, it's like a zoo, but they're all rescued animals from the illegal wildlife trade, um, deforestation, different circumstances. This is Lucky the Elephant. I've met and photographed her a few times. Now, any, anyone can have a bad day. She's generally pretty friendly, but this particular day, because I've met her over a few years, I thought we were really good friends. And I was walking alongside her on her flank and I was patting her on the bum. And her tail came and went <coughs> in my face. And I thought, oh, it's a funny mistake for an elephant to make. Just hit me in the face. I thought, oh well. I went like that again. She went like that. I went, don't do it a third time. <laughs> it's her way of saying, stop touching me. I'll kill you. Uh, this is me with Champa the moon bear in Laos. She's a bear that had uh, hydrocephalus when she was little, so she had fluid on the brain, had a really big head, and she had brain surgery about five years ago to fix that. First bear in the world to have brain surgery. And Free the Bears is this great charity that we work with, been all around the world for them, different centres in Southeast Asia. 
And they said to me, you can come to Laos and visit and you can photograph, you can go in with Champa. She's like one of the few moon bears in the world in rescue you can go in with. I was like, well, that sounds great. And the morning I got there was literally the first time in her life that she was having an off day. <laughs> and uh, Matt, the CEO from Free the Bears, went in first and he went to give her some food and she actually went for him. Now she's normally um, a little bit, quite, moves quite slow and very slow moving. And he was shocked and I'm standing right behind him about to meet her. So what was good for me is I saw how fast her right hand could move. And he then said, look, most bears generally know if they want to grab you and hurt you or how hard they're squeezing you, she doesn't. So she's probably more dangerous in a sense because she doesn't know what she's doing. She might think she's playing and she's actually snapped you in half. I'm like, oh, I wish I'd talked about this before we left home and flew this way. <laughs> oh, she was beautiful. So what I did is I formed a connection with her by giving her food and very, making it very clear I wasn't taking it back. So we played games like, do you want some sweet potato? No, thank you. Would you like to peel your own banana? Yes, please. And I gave her food and she'd do these things. Obviously here, I'm quite relaxed, I'm laying down. She's eating her food. She's actually just looking around. Um, and then Deb said to me, you have a photo with Champa. And I said, OK, I don't, all right, let's see how that goes. And I stood next to her. And here, you can tell straight away my body language is I'm not comfortable. <laughs> She's too interested in me. I am too close to um, the swipe hand. And I literally end up saying, look, that's, that's the photo we're going to get because I'm going to turn my back on this huge bear who could do me some damage. So you have to set your own boundaries about what you're comfortable with. Um, whilst in India for Free the Bears, and here's Matt, the CEO, uh, we were photographing for their adoption certificates when people adopt them from overseas. And Matt said, let's go with the blind bears. There's about six blind bears in this enclosure and we'll photograph them one at a time for their adoption certificates. So these are captive but wild bears. Now, when they're blind, their sense of smell is even stronger than normal. So um, this looks quite calm, but I'm actually running around the teepee because the bear is sniffing, going, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God, it kept coming at me. Uh, we pull our cameras down, and I hear a noise. I look, and there are two bears in there, and the keeper has left us in there by ourselves. And I say to Matt, 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 there's two bears. Like, Who's letting the bears out? And he goes, oh, no. I said, you photograph that one. I'll just run away from this one. Next minute, pulled our cameras down. There were five bears in there, all trying to get us. Um, meanwhile, these photos are being taken from the fence, I might add. Everyone's standing there laughing, thinking it was quite fun. Um, but we're, we're quite freaked out. And Matt said, oh, no, where's Chompy? And I said, who's Chompy? And he said, she's the one that lives in enclosure six, little den six, that can let herself in and out and tries to kill everyone. Luckily, on that day, she was the only bear that didn't get let out. Anyway, Keeper turned up and went, sorry, I'm helping you. And we said, yeah, no. Could you put them back, please, and we got out of there. But again, you've got to be really on your game when you're working with animals. And practice. I mean, people say to me, um, how do you progress what you do, or how do you get really good at something? I can tell you what settings I use. I can tell you how I shoot the next stage of that, the, the intermediate to advanced, I guess, level is just practice. Practice, practice, practice. And I take probably... Every thousand shots, I might show 10. I'm an overshooter. I will shoot and shoot and shoot. When I went to the Antarctic, I took 18,000 photos in six days. I did not want to come home and go, oh, I should have got that penguin I saw doing this thing. And we had um, 20 people on that trip with us. And some of them stayed in the bar when we got to go on shore. Some of them slept all day. And when they came home, they went, oh, we'd like to go back. And we came back going, we completely got the most out of that trip we could, and we photographed every single penguin on that ice. We didn't need to go back. The elephant shots from earlier. So the elephant rolled around in the lake. This was the first shot I got as it came out of the water, did the little bubble. I had my camera on burst mode, so shooting really fast. The second shot was the question mark in the series, and then I kept shooting, and then I got, as the third shot, the splash. Now, it's really hard, especially when you're quite attached to your pictures. Like, I loved all these photos, and I thought, if I want to show a picture that represents the elephant coming out of the water, I love this last one, and I love the second one. But the problem is, if you put two pictures out there, whether it's on social media or a website, people start to switch off. You, know, you put seven photos on there, by the time they get to number six, they're like, oh, like, what's the best shot? And I chose this one, because although I love the splash, I just thought the question mark shape of that was kind of unique, and I didn't get it in any of my other pictures. But it is hard to kind of be that discerning and pick through them. A couple of things not to forget. Research your subject. Indo-Chinese tigers have a 10-metre leap. That is longer than this room. 
pretty much. That is that way. And they can jump three meters high, like that. So if you are 10 meters away, that's one bound they can be at you. And they can kill. If you're photographing Indo-Chinese tigers, these are all things that you need to know. In Cambodia, they have Indo-Chinese tigers in captivity that have been rescued in massive big enclosures. And they have small windows in the enclosure that they can open. They could literally jump through if you wanted to. And you can shoot through them to the tigers. 60 feet away, I'm using a big zoom, the tiger at 60 feet. So based on how far they could jump, I'd have a few seconds to get out of the way, shut the, the little window. Um, if that tiger decided on that day, my number was up. My second visit to Cambodia, I said, let's photograph the tigers. And I had the 70, 200 mil zoom on. And I was there with a guy um, who's the, the tiger guy, Nick, who runs the sanctuary. And I was leaning in through the window and the tiger kept walking right past under the window. And of course, I kept backing off, bearing in mind they jumped that far and that high. And in the end, the tiger's body language was fairly relaxed. It wasn't too interested in me, kept going past. And I thought, well, this is not too bad. And Nick said to me, you can probably stay there if you're comfortable. He's not going to do anything. He's quite not bothered by you. Tiger ended up laying down right there, like three feet away from me. But I made a rookie mistake. When I photograph monkeys, they quite often look at the lens and then look away to see where the monkey's gone. I pointed a massive zoom from three feet into a tiger's face. That was fine while he was just looking around. And all of a sudden, he looked straight down the barrel, saw his own reflection, pupils narrowed. And I was just standing there thinking, oh, wow, that's a really cool shot. And went, ugh. <laughs> and he lunged at me. I did that too. I completely died. And he lunged. Now, I can't tell you how quickly I flew out of that window. Never moved so fast in my life. And I stood there. All the people behind the safety fence jumped as well. There was a whole crowd at this particular place. And we all just went, whoa, fire. That was, that was the biggest warning. Anyway, I was like, wow, this is... Deb was like, that was great. Did you get the shot? I said, yeah, well, it's nearly my last shot. I mean, it's not as nice as blue clams. You want to end on a high. They'd be like, what were her photos like? Oh, they were all right. But did you see how she died? She was in a tiger's enclosure with a head, like, lens in its face. Be on the Darwin Awards for the stupidest photographer ever. Anyway, so I was standing there and I was like, wow, I was really a little bit frightened. And um, Nick said, if you're comfortable, you can get back, lean back in there. And I did. And I clicked three frames and she looked at me and I just said to him, no, nah, next time there's no warning, I will die. I woke up at five o'clock the next day in a cold sweat just going, never, ever, ever do that again. This was, um, Deb was doing my behind the scenes photos, but stopped when I was right in past my shirt in this window when she laid down because... I think, Deb, you thought it was quite, f you thought it was good. <laughs> You're like, wow, that's so, such great shots. So I was right in really close. And I mean, that's, I'll never, ever do that again. Because that first photo was perfectly fine. And it still makes me feel sick that I, I did that. On to business success. A little bit to go. Yeah, right, if you've got pen and paper, feel free to write this down. Some of them are so simple, but they're all little things that work for me. And first, most important one, love what you do. What we're, you know, we're here for such a short period of time. Why are we doing anything if we don't love it? Photography, I really, I love that this is my job. I feel so blessed and honoured. But I also really, I guess, um, admire people who can just shoot for fun. There's no pressure involved in it. Just shoot because you purely love it. No stress, no pressure. Um, I have some people who contact me saying, I need to make money. I need to know how to photograph pets and run a business. How do I do it? And I, you're just like, you've got to take all that away. Do you love pets? Well, no, but I could make money. No, it's not going to work. You've got to have your heart and soul in it. Whatever it is, love what you do. I've learned in business that my most valuable asset, whether you have one, a hundred or a thousand, are your clients. Sometimes they will drive you crazy. Sometimes you will love them more than anything, but they are your top priority. Keeping them happy is business reputation. It doesn't matter what they spend. It matters what they say when they walk out those doors and tell everyone about their experience. That is what they remember. And I've also learned, regardless of achievement, I always try and look after my clients. My business has grown from 10 clients a year to I now photograph 800, 900 domestic pets a year. I work an 80 to 100 hour week and I'm booked out six months ahead. I still have to make sure every client is treated like the only client, like I did when I had all the time in the world and just 10 clients to worry about. And in that, I'm very grateful for these things, trips to New York, books, travel, awards. But without my core customer clients, there, there's none of that. The whole house of cards falls down. They are everything. And I have to treat them like everything. And I do. I love them. I'm very grateful to them. 
Without them, there's no photographs. There's no pets. Always say thank you. Actually, I've found, I have to say, I've found New Yorkers to be extremely polite. Or maybe it's Australians are just not so much sometimes, but you guys are very polite generally, and you hold a door open, people say thank you. But the way I started working with Tamron is I won a photographic competition about five years ago, and I got sent a bag, camera bag. And I didn't need it. I had a camera bag. But I wrote to Tamron and just said, hey, that's a really nice bag. Thank you for that lovely prize. And they wrote back and said, oh, thank you. No one ever says thank you. <laughs> By the way, love your dog photos. So I kept that. I sat on that for about a year. And my brand started growing a little bit in Australia. And I thought, I've used some brands since the inception of my photographic career. I use certain hard drives, certain you know, camera bodies, certain bags, certain tripod brands. I'm very brand loyal. And I thought, maybe it's time to start endorsing a brand that I'm so loyal about. I run courses. I tell people what I use. They go and buy those things. So I wrote to my contact at Tamron and said, hey, I'm, I'm expanding the brand a little bit. Um, how do you feel about me representing low pro bags? Because I've used low pro. I still do use low pro. And they said, oh, actually, we've got a few ambassadors for that. Would you consider this new range of lenses we're making for Tamron? And I said, OK, if it doesn't change my output and my image quality is the same, and they said, great, here, have them for three weeks. Let us know what you think. Four years ago, I've never taken them off. Four years later, I still use them. So it was just through making a contact by saying thank you. People remember manners. They remember thanks. And it's just I kind of always feel grateful. So I always like to appreciate the people that helped me get there along the way. Um, I've done this one really wrongly before. Spell people's names correctly in email and correspondence. It's such a small thing, but for first impression, it really matters. I remember once I had these pictures at a vet clinic and I, and I wrote to the director who was saying, do we want to continue keeping your pictures here or not? And um, I spelt his name wrong and he wrote back and said, by the way, my name is this. And I was like, oops, like, you know. I, I just normally say, that's okay, you can call me Alice. And they go, oh, yeah, great. But, you know, so it's so simple, but it is something that just people always not, don't always do and don't always get right. Whether you have a tiny profile or a big profile, there'll always be people that gravitate towards that, that you work with animals or you photograph something in a certain area, a certain way. They'll want to work with you or they'll want to help you. Um, I had someone write to me the other day and say, I'd love to work with you. Um, I'll work for free if you just give me knowledge. Like, there's always that exchange. People want to know, can I help you in some way? Can I be involved? They want to be a part of something. Really early on in my career, when I was just fumbling around doing the cheap pet photography thing for $50, I wrote to um, another photo photography studio and said, if you ever go on holidays and you need someone to fill in, I'd love to be trained up and help. And I never heard back. And even now, 10 years later, I'm still going on about it. No. Uh, but you know, I, never, I never forgot that, what it felt like just to be ignored, even though they just said, we're right. You know? Instead, I opened my own business and I became a competitor. Yeah. So. It's not something I want from others <laughs> as well, but it's courtesy. So just this week, I've probably had half a dozen people write and say, can I work with you? Can I do work experience? Um, it is actually the genuine truth that, one, I don't have time. I race from one thing to the next. And um, a lot of the animals I work with react quite badly to other people being in the studio, to strangers. But I always make sure I say, wow, thank you so much for seeing my business as a business you would like to be a part of. That really is lovely. Unfortunately, I don't have provision to assist, but all the best. And if you need anything, you know, and then they go, wow, that's amazing. Can I buy your book? I'm like, you can buy 10. <laughs> don't endorse anything you don't use or wholeheartedly believe in. I get sent a lot of things and a lot of things I send back. There's probably six products that I use consistently. They're the six products I live and die by. Because if I'm going to tell you that this lens is fantastic and you buy it and you're not happy, it comes down to me recommending that. So I only personally put my name to things I use extensively and that I believe in. This one's very tiny, but it says, be authentic in everything you do. And in that, always speak in your own voice using your own words. It's just put yourself forward. So quite often, um, some of the brands I work with will say, here's our post to promote something. I'm more than happy to promote it because they're ba brands that help me and that's part of the exchange. There's always that trade off, but I'll still change it into my own words because that's my voice. And that's what my market responds to, and that's how I am. And being authentic, it's, that's what people want. You don't want to see someone standing up there that's not being themselves. And very importantly, 
you got to work with organisations, companies, charities, businesses whose ethics align with yours. And it's it's you know one it's brand integrity I guess my brand is so built on animal rescue and welfare that I'm very careful about the businesses. If I aligned with a clothing company, would I necessarily work with one that sold fur? No, because it goes against my brand ethics in what I do. And in that, I do a lot of charity work. I've mentioned it a few times, but I was just going to run through a few of the special projects I've done over the years. So when I first started taking photos, I just had this belief that if you do something with animals or you're working with animals, you should try and help them through that, that skill or that ability. So we now give away half a million Australian dollars a year in services, images and sponsorship to charities all over the world. That includes flying in and doing shoots for them and then basically gifting them those photos and running projects to raise money for them as well. And to be honest, that's, the, that's my motivation. That's a bit that I absolutely get up for every day. This was a project for one of our dog rescue shelters. Some of these dogs had been in the kennels for four years and we did a long-termers, like long-termers in jail, kind of long-termers project. These were just a poster series. They went out in supermarkets and shops. Actually, one of our local shops still has one up. It's four years later. They've all been adopted, but the poster's still there. And except for actually this guy, they, there was 10 of them. They all got homes literally within two weeks because of the public exposure. The media is more likely to run a story if there's a specific project around it or a specific point to it. And every year, we also do Santa paws for them where people come and bring their dogs and the dogs sit with Santa and they pay for a digital file photograph which they otherwise normally can't get through the studio and they can put it on Christmas cards and make some products out of it. Um, I have the easy dog, easy dog, easy job. I have an easy dog as well. Uh, because basically Santa has to do all the work in holding the dogs. I just get to sit there and take photos. Santa gets um, weed on, kicked in the head, sexually assaulted, it's dreadful. And every year he says, poor Santa says, I'm never doing this again. And we'll say, we'll give you a carton of beer. And he's like, OK, I'll do it again for the dogs. But we, we can raise you know, five, ten thousand $10,000 depending on the day with that. Um, some people have been coming, doing it for about seven years now. Some people have come every single year, get their Santa Paws photo. And then we did another series on dogs with um, afflictions, dogs who are a bit different. Snoopy without a leg, Rusty didn't, had epilepsy, and Georgie was malnourished, not that you can tell by that shot. And the whole thing was, what do they need? Snoopy doesn't need another leg, just needed a new home. So they did really well as well, just raising awareness for pets. And they all got adopted off those posters. This was actually the cover for Saving Animals from Euthanasia, a charity. And it was the cover of their calendar. And when I did this shoot, I didn't realize that two of them were predators and two of them were prey. Uh, predators, prey. The easiest, most chilled out two were these two. They're kind of whatever. I don't think any animal is evil, but I'm sorry to point out this cat. <laughs> And this poor, flat-eared, terrified dog. That cat tried to bop that dog in the head so many times that the poor dog was like, please, just get the shot. So we did. We had to keep going, so just hold my hand there and quickly take the shot so it didn't get scratched in the eye. Uh, flew to Bali, and I, we basically took Bali rescue animals that had just come in off the street, photographed them on a white backdrop, and came home and raised uh, uh, some money through selling uh, A4 and A3 prints for $20 and $30. They would have been US. Cheap prints, we raised 15,000 Australian dollars, which is probably about 12 grand, 12 and a half grand US, just from selling 20 and $30 prints, mostly of this puppy that had mange. Not in this pose, but a very similar pose looking at the camera, looking like little Yoda. So again, the right photograph viewed by the right audience at the right time has great power to raise money, raise awareness. And then all the Cambodian animals we've been showing, we went there and did a big photo shoot. And that evening, same concept, one night only, got to come to the exhibition tonight to buy your print. $20 and $30 prints, we raised $25,000. Um, half of that went to Free the Bears, who have a centre there, and half of it went to the, all the other uh, animals. The Free the Bears, 12500 for an entire year, paid for the bear cub keeper's wages, all the bears' formula, and built a classroom to educate children. Twelve and a half grand. In, in Southeast Asia, that just goes so far. And just recently in June, we went to Cambodia, Vietnam and led a tour also for Free the Bears. This is their Cambodian sanctuary. This is the first photo where I've ever actually had the concept before I took the picture. So I was standing there watching these bear cubs come and go. This is the same window of the den. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to just do like nine pictures composited of them coming and going and make it look like a little apartment? Mm -hmm. Normally I take pictures and get home and go, oh, I should. So I was quite excited that I had this new idea. And I stood there for an hour and a half, took a couple hundred shots, and when I got home, 
put 16 of them together, called it Bear Apartment 6. And I thought, wow, I showed the people on the tour. There are about 10 of them. And they went, well, buy one. It's like, great, just made 10 sales. I thought, how can we raise some money for the, these beautiful bears? These are all cubs. So 100 prints, 100 Australian dollars each, and limited edition, once they're sold, they're gone. Sold them in five days, made them $10,000, just off a Facebook post. And then all the back work in printing them and sending them, but my photo lab did a deal on printing, et cetera, et cetera. So we sold them as you know, 16 square inch prints. So the right picture, the right time, right market can have a great impact. Do things go wrong? No. It's the end of that. <laughs> no, no, they're always a dream. Um, yes, they do. And this is um, pretty much the last big section. So um, sometimes they will wee on your backdrop. <laughs> Um, now, there was actually a friend of mine sitting that side, and when the pig weed, because the little hoofs were pushing into the couch, the, the we must have been touching the feet, and she started kicking, and my friend was going, oh, there's a pig <laughs> which I thought was quite funny, because I was all dry. Um, they will wee on your white backdrop. I have to say, I don't see them doing it and take the photo. I'm shooting so fast, I suddenly realise they're doing it and stop, and then we try and clean up. It's not like some weird thing where we wait to the... <laughs> it's a whole other type of photography. Um, <laughs> They will show you their bums. Um, Deb and I did a course once with uh, someone who can communicate with animals through um, mentally. And I don't have that ability. I use body language and just my knowledge of animal behavior and how I move around them and, and I make friends with them and do all that. But what I learned from her course is she said that they might not speak English, but they understand everything you say. So I talk to them like they're about a th as I would a three-year-old child. Don't lick the PowerPoint, ah, ah, stop, get off there, put that down, you know, that kind of thing. And so when they show me their bums, I say to them, I put that on Facebook, and I tell you what, they turn around, quick smart. <laughs> they will get in your lens hood and stop you taking photos so that people take photos of you, not taking photos of them. <laughs> they will pull your hair, great. They will jump on your head. Uh, when I got, and Jonas, I've just stopped. It's like that quick grasshopper on my eye. I'm just like, oh my God. I had all bleeding scratches through my hair when I got home. They're big birds with big claws. Uh, went to the farm sanctuary, and uh, my lovely friend Rachel owns this gorgeous farm sanctuary. This is Vinnie the goat. And I thought it was really funny because he, he stopped me and he jumped on my car and he's jumping up and down on the roof and having a great time. And I got out and took a photo, and then I realized later that as he was skidding off, he'd scratched through all five layers of paint, caused about $8,000 worth of damage to my car. <laughs> Great. Uh, then I laid on the ground and Vinny jumped on me. Uh, I had to go to the chiropractor not long after that because I was like, oh, but goats love climbing on stuff. They will jump on your shoe, a little penguin, little rescue penguin jumping on my foot. While I'm trying to escape Alex Pig, who was my favourite pig, I was photographing near the fence and suddenly I felt a squash and when I pulled my camera down, she had parked herself, this great big 300 kilogram pig had parked herself right there and I thought, I was like, can you move? And she's like, mm-mm. So I thought, we'll just use her as a four-legged tripod. <laughs> uh, they will hang off your gear. I'm actually trying to shoot, and these are orphaned rescue baby macaques. They are hanging off the camera strap and swinging, and I'm just like, oh, goodness. Uh, one of them got someone's hair clip, spent the whole time up the top going, hey. They're just, they're awesome. They will bite you on the pants. Simple brief. Can you please photograph the puppy in cage C6, it's a rescue place, uh, for our calendar cover? Yeah, sure. I'm in there by myself and it just, I could not get him off me. He was, just, you know, puppies just bite, bite my face, bite my arms, and I'm like, oh my goodness. In the end, I quickly put him in his bed, got a shot and ran before he could attack me. They will bite you on the finger. So that is my, uh, yeah, it's this finger. It's a leopard cat kitten. Uh, in Southeast Asia, one of the world's most expensive illegal exotic pets over there. They'll bite you on the face. Puppies, they're so dangerous. They get in your face, bite me on the nose. They look cute, careful. Uh, they'll bite you on the leg. This is Todd the bear cub. And he got out of his little copper log enclosure. And I said to Matt at Free the Bears, can I put him back in? He said, yeah, I'd seen how they pick him up, back the front, because they kick and kick and kick. And I picked him up. He was kind of the weight of like a solid puppy, like a Staffordshire Terrier or something. And he kicked and kicked. And as I put him down, he looked at me, grabbed my leg and went, hunker, a bit, and ran away. <laughs> So I have been bitten by a bear. Please don't tell anyone it was. Uh, this goat I'm trying to photograph, he's trying to bunt me in the head. 
Uh, this is Mabel. She actually recently passed away, a little rescue joey. These lovely ladies um, bought me 15 joeys all at once. Mm -hmm. And even, I think kangaroos in Australia are an animal because we're used to them, we quite often overlook, but they're pretty amazing creatures. And Mabel's thing was to stand in front and basically slap you in the face. Unless you went like that back, very gently, she would keep doing it. So I've had to put down my gear and play pat a cake uh, to keep her happy. While well, this one's like, are you taking my photo? What's going on? <laughs> and I um, wear this fabulous belt called Spider Holster that you, I put my camera into. Some of you already picked up what's going on in this shot. I wear it like this. And Spider Holster is an American company. And they said, could you think, do you think the wildlife park would take a picture of a camera, a camera and baby Joey sitting on the camera wedged in the holster. I said, oh yeah, sure. So this tiny little koala, like, oh my God. And sitting there and took some shots, got back home and couldn't use a single one because she's grabbing me on the... <laughs> <laughs> and I sent it to them on an email and said, I'm really sorry. I don't know if we're gonna be able to do this again, but, and they put it on Facebook. So everyone has seen it. I'm like, well, I kind of trying to hide that. <laughs> and snakes. So this is a dugite, one of our really venomous snakes in Australia. We have quite a few snakes in Australia. Don't worry, if you come and visit, you generally won't see any, but we do have quite a few. This gentleman that owns these snakes does the training on how you handle them if you find one in your house or your backyard. So I did this shoot. We did puff adders, death adders, dugites, tiger snakes. Virtue of the fact they're venomous, they're highly aggressive. The tiger snake just spat venom all over the studio just because it could. I then had to clean it down because if I touched it and touched my eye, not so good. Anyway, they also bought Lieutenant Dan. He is, a, do you know um, Forrest Gump, Lieutenant Dan, he's got no legs. Uh, they brought him along and Adam had him with him and he said, oh, we just got Lieutenant Dan and I'd love him to have some photos. I said, oh, he looks awesome. So he's a children's pet, carpet python. They, they often buy them for kids. So I moved back about this close nice and close to Lieutenant Dan. And anyway, we went to put him on the couch and I said to Adam, put that nice green pot you've got there with him, be good for colour. Right as he put the pot down, Lieutenant Dan went Whoosh! and struck the pot, just missed Adam's hand. I went, whoa, he's a bit angry. Uh, Adam's then walked away to go back around and put the pot down. And as I turned back, Lieutenant Dan is doing that pose right here, going like this. Now I had nowhere to go. I had my camera, I had seen how fast he could move and I was Internally, I knew I was putting out fear, which is the worst thing you can do because that's when they'll go for you. I remember putting my hand there and just leaning back and I was saying, Adam, Adam. And after about a minute, he turned around and went, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And he came and grabbed him. And I said, oh, is he, is he okay? I thought he was okay. Like he's a children's pet. He said, oh no, I've only had him for a week and he's already bitten my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Point being, I thought the venomous snakes were bad. I nearly got offed by the children's pet. What can you do? At the end of the day, you've got to laugh it off. You know, it makes for great stories and you learn from it. I actually photographed another snake recently, another carpet python, for the first time since that shoot, which is about a year and a half ago. And I was, I was like holding my breath and I was being really weird and I realised it was a bit of post-traumatic stress from that experience. Having a snake that far from your face that in any second can bite you. And the snake I was photographing the other day, I photographed many times, he's beautiful. And the handler kept saying, he won't bite you. What, what's wrong with you? You photograph these, you know, things, these guys all the time. And I was just like, oh, it's just the memory of being that internally scared of what's going to happen. At the end of the day, photography is just a wonderful creative view, a way to communicate your view. It's fun, worthwhile, and it will bring you joy. I hope that's what you all get from it. So get out there and please shoot what you love, whatever that is. I have a book. It's a nice segue, wasn't it? I have a book. Uh, it's available online or where all good books are sold, so please check it out. If you're into dogs, it's dogs in a meditative zen state. Uh, called Zen Dogs. There's some little cards here too if you forget and my details on the back too. A um, couple of shots from Zen Dogs. Um, they're literally kind of blinks where they're holding their blink but they're looking pretty chilled and happy. They have to be in a pretty relaxed happy state to get that type of shot and it's pretty quick timing to catch it. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see that but they're on here as well. These are my contact details. Please if anyone has any questions about lenses you know I shoot food photography, what lens should I use? Um, I use all these lenses all the time probably one of the most prolific Tamron users in the world because I shoot with them thousands and thousands of photos a week every single week of the year. So please feel free to contact me anytime through email or Facebook with any questions on gear. Um, anything we've discussed today, uh, I'm more than happy to. Thank you so much for your time. Yes.
Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.